Valley Talk on News Talk 1580 KGAL. And welcome to Valley Talk. It's Monday, and the sun is trying to shine, and boy, it sure looks nice out there when it does. Hey, I'm Dave Adams. Glad you're with us today. We have a couple of guests on the show I think you'll find of interest. First is Ralph Scariano, who's with Edward Jones Investments here in Albany. Ralph, thank you for being with us on Valley Talk today. Thank you for having me, Dave. We're going to talk about Edward Jones Investments, uh, what they do here in Albany, and also maybe what their crystal ball looks like as they go into the future. Talk about investing, what investors are looking at, and, you know, from a lay perspective, I'm going to ask some questions about, uh, you know, should people be afraid of the stock market? There are some people just because of things seem to be in such a, a turmoil, at least as you look at the news. Um, and that's really scaring a lot of people away from the stock market. Is that good, bad, and different? Should they be stay away? We're going to be talking about that here in a moment. Tom Cordier is going to be the guest here in about 25 minutes on Valley Talk. A lot of discussion about measures 22116 and 22117 in Albany. Uh, city voters are going to be voting on that. Measure 22117 requires a public vote. Please turn off your cell phones. Whenever uh, measure 22117 requires a public vote, whenever the city would add to its debt, measure 22116 would require a public vote to create new urban renewal districts in the city or when uh, a substantial change is made to the existing district. So we're going to be talking about that. A lot of discussion in the media. Uh, there's uh, Both sides are really fighting pitched campaigns on this. And we'll be talking to Tom today. This Thursday, we are going to be talking to Sharon Canopa, mayor of Albany, about uh, why they're opposing these two measures. And, of course, today we're going to be talking to Tom about why he's pushing them and pushing them very, very hard. So that's going to be coming up in about 25 minutes here on Valley Talk. Don't forget to sign up for Quiznos Taste on Us. Send me an email, dave at kgal.com, or you can call the station at 926-KGAL or 451-KGAL and say you want to be put into the drawing for Quiznos Taste on Us. The winner will get a $10 gift certificate at the end of the show today at noon, and that can be used for anything at Quiznos in Albany next to uh, Novak's Restaurant and next to the former G.I. Joe's Sporting Goods location. Chips. Um, sub sandwich, drinks, whatever. Take a buddy in there and have lunch on us because the taste is on us. Quiznos, Albany. Thank you to Dale and the crew for being involved with us here in the Valley Talk Show here on KGAL. Rob Scariano, Edward Jones Investments. Making sense of investing is what your business card says. Thank you for being with us on Valley Talk. And thank you, Dave. Glad to be here. A little bit of your history. How long have you been here? Tell us, tell us what Edward Jones Investments does here in Albany. Yes, um, Edward Jones. Uh, actually, I started uh, the Albany first Albany office in 1981, uh, April of 81. So it's going on 30, just finishing 32 years, I think, starting maybe 33. And at that time, Edward Jones had about 295 offices in the nation. Today, we have over 12,000 offices in 50 states. In 1981, we had three offices in or three offices in Oregon. I think I was the fourth office in Oregon. Today, we have eight offices in Albany and over 250 offices in Oregon, and as I said, 12,000 in 50 states around the country. Uh, we were in in uh, Great Britain, UK. We pulled out of there about a year and a half ago. Why? Uh, it you just w it just wasn't the right uh, model for us over there, and uh, just it didn't work. We've been in Canada for over 10, 12 years, and that's working very, very well. We thought we could be successful in Britain, and at one point we had the opportunity to uh, get involved with a, a, a UK firm that uh, bought us out, and we decided to stick to where we were doing business the best, and that's in the U.S. and Canada at this point. What is your typical client? Do you? I, I was friends with the one investor in Bend, an investment firm, and they would only deal with people that had a million dollars to invest. If what's the you know what kind of customers are you looking for? That's that's a great question, and and we don't uh, set limits like that on on our clientele. Actually, each one of the financial advisors for Edward Jones. It, a lot of people think we're a franchise because it appears to be a franchise. We are all employees of Edward Jones. But the business model is such that each financial advisor has their office, and if you didn't know better, it would look like a franchise. Edward Jones lets us run that, firm, that, that branch office as if it were our own business, which means as long as we are ethical, legal, and profitable, we can do anything we want in terms of how we run our customer-based our, our, our customer business, our customer-oriented business. 
what that means is we might have some advisors around the country that say, um, gosh, I, I won't talk to anybody unless they've got a half a million or this or that. As a rule, that is not the Edward Jones philosophy. If I were to sum up what our philosophy is, we are focused on the serious long-term investor. We want to meet the financial goals of the serious long-term investor, whether that means retirement, whether that means preparing for uh, elder uh, life in, in the uh, elder years, whether that means funding a college education, saving for a vacation home, whatever your goals are, we're looking for the serious long-term investor. We're not looking for the hot stock trader, the hot tipper, the market timer. And so if we were to disqualify somebody as a, a possible client, it might be the person who comes in and says, look, I'm going to give you X amount of money. I'll see what you can do for it. You know, that's not the kind of client we're seeking. We're seeking the client who says, I've got serious money here, and here's my goals, and can you help me, and what is your plan? And we, we, we get that out front. We get that out front. Now, as I was leading to just a moment ago, the, I want to call it Sunday investor, but the person that doesn't have a lot of experience in the stock market and kind of the dabbler, if you will, mm -hmm. things have been so volatile in the news and in the stock market that it's really scared off a lot of those people. And... Should it? What what advice would you give to a person that doesn't have a lot of investment savvy, not of a lot of experience? You know, maybe they have a little bit of money, but they're almost wanting to go out in the backyard and dig a hole and bury it. My advice to that investor uh, would be: I would talk to at least two, if not three, different financial advisors, and you want to match that financial advisor with maybe your personality and in your sentiment, if you will. And hopefully that financial advisor, whether it be one of ours or a competitor of ours, will listen to you. If they're not, you should probably get up and leave. Uh, but they, you'd want a financial advisor who is going to understand your goals, understand your dreams, understand where you want to go, understand your risk tolerance. And then you say, okay, I understand your, your short-term, long-term goals. I understand your risk tolerance. And we have questionnaires and so do the other firms that help discern what that risk tolerance might be and we come back and say okay based on your risk tolerance based on your time frame based on your long-term goals here's some options for you and if you interview two or three different financial advisors whether it be us or a competitor hopefully you'll come up with that male or female advisor that is going to help work with you and then then we're going to talk to that person and, and we're going to say you know, retirement isn't a one-year goal. You might be 30, it might be a 30-year goal. You might be 40, it might be a 20-year goal. Let's not get caught up on the short-term volatility of the market. Everybody got nervous when things went to heck in, 19, in 2008, and rightfully so. It was the worst market we've had since the Depression. But staying out of the market did not serve anybody well in 2009, 2010, 2011, or 2012. And so, again, what does this year look like? We're looking at all kinds of the European debt crisis. We're looking at uh, the fiscal cliff that just got taken, quote unquote, taken care of or postponed. We're looking at the uh, sequestration, sequestration coming up here on March 1st. Those are all reasons for people to back off. But the market predicts, anticipates, not predicts, but it pr anticipates the future, whether it be good or bad. Right now, the market is saying, we're going to have some volatility. We're going to have some ups and downs. But let's look long term here. What would you say to the investor again? Go back to the Sunday investor. And Wall Street, to be frank, got a black eye because of you know the, the unregulated securities that when they bundled all these home mortgages together and sold them as insured investments, and then it all the rug got pulled out. And, and so I, I remember seeing some political satire con cartoons that were comparing Wall Street uh, dealers and investors with uh, uh, used car salesmen. Mm -hmm. In fact, less you know, less reputable than used car sales. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what would you say to the people that are, still remember that and say, you know, I don't know if I can trust those guys on Wall Street. They're playing fast and loose with my money and, and I just can't trust them. What would you, there still might be some people out there that, that remember that and really don't trust Wall Street. What would right. you say? I would say that uh, mistrust is probably well-founded. Uh, you know, I understand where they're coming from, but again, if you sit down with that financial advisor, it, they may not even recommend that you buy individual stocks or packaged products or whatever you want to call it. They may sit down and say, gosh, Dave, you know, for your scenario and your point in life, there's a different avenue for you. Maybe it's a, a managed account of some sort, or maybe it's a tax-deferred annuity, or maybe it's municipal bonds. So, Again, uh, we're not talking about um, 
trying to get everybody in the market or or buy and sell and trade. Uh, I think there is, you know, it's, it's like any other business. There's there's good people and bad people, good firms and, and people who are, are, are uh, uh, less benefit to the customer or the client. And I think the key for, for the Sunday investor, as you term it, mm-hmm. or for any investor, sure. is to meet with somebody that they can build a trust and build a relationship with and let and share their goals, share their dreams, and, and uh, their risk tolerance, and make sure that they come up with a plan for the long term. And there's ways to avert these ups and downs and the volatility. Are you optimistic about the future and why? I am very optimistic about the future. And, and the reason why, we get a lot of negativity in the media, the national media, and, and of course when the stock market goes down, couple hundred points, we, it's a big deal, and when the stock market goes up a couple hundred points, you barely hear about it, and, uh, you know, we've had, we've had a very, very good recovery. It's been sluggish, but we have had a recovery. The market started going down in 2007. We had a recession in 2008. We came out of the recession. We've had growth of about 2.2% going forward. We're looking for about the same type of growth. Last year, in 2012, corporate earnings of the S&P 500 companies we're up an average a little over 5%, or just about 5%, I should say. Uh, that's a little bit below the long-term growth of corporate earnings. Long-term growth of corporate earnings has been about 6% since 1954. Um, there's a real correlation to long-term earnings growth and stock markets. So if, if long-term earnings growth, in fact, since 54, it's been about 6 plus percent, and the stock market has been about 6.5%, when you add dividends in, the stock market has returned about 10.5% since 1954. You look at that and you go, yeah, but what about 08? What about uh, 2000? What about 2001? There's going to be those years. There's going to be those years. But long term, I'm very optimistic. Uh, the stock market has, has been the tried and true uh, uh, performer over time. So your advice stay the course? Stay the course. And stay and and have a plan that's not the same plan for everybody. And there's no there's not this rule anymore of you're 60, you need this. You're 20, you need that. When an investor comes into my office and our offices here in town, we don't tell them, well, Dave, you're this age, so this is what you and your family need. Or, or Joe, you're this age. Or Mary, you're this age. We sit down and we could have a 90-year-old investing in the stock market and we could have a 25-year-old investing in treasury bonds and muni bonds. We want to talk to the client and we want to see... What is your risk tolerance? What is your time horizon? What are your goals? And we, then we'll make recommendations. What would you say to the people who may not have trust again? Let's get back to this. May not have trust in the stock market. Are, are we looking at um, instruments that we're investing in and making sure they're you know, reasonably safe? Uh, we know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the bungling of the the secure the the home mortgages right. that were questionable, and then they were told that they we were told that they were insured and they were not, and that the rug got pulled out from under that and then it came crashing down. Again, depending on the amount of money a person has and their risk tolerance and, and those kinds of things, we're going to recommend it's some, for some people it might be a portfolio of individual stocks. For other people it might be what they call an advisory account or a managed account. Uh, it might be a, a, a mutual fund of some sort. And those things were not uh, deemed bad during this last downturn. The, the packaged Mm-hmm. pooled mortgage products, the collateralized mortgage obligations, CMOs, those kind of things, those were deemed bad. And then there were some, and, there, and some of them, not all of them, there were some that were poor, but they weren't all bad. Uh, but that did, that did give Wall Street a bad name. And I, mm-hmm. I think one of the things that happens in this business, and right now you may know, Dave, I'm sure you do, interest rates are historically low. They're as low as they were back in the 50s. And so what investors are finding themselves doing in general, I'm just generalizing, not everybody, but in general, they're seeking yield, and we, we refer to that as chasing yield. So I'll get a call from somebody, and they'll say, I want to be XYZ, I want to buy XYZ, Ralph, it's paying 8%. I said, well, what is XYZ? I don't know, I just looked in the Wall Street Journal, it's paying 8%. Typically, when you find something like that, you don't know what it is, but you see the yield is 8%, there's probably a reason that it's 8%. It probably has more risk. And so one of our jobs is to counsel people and say, you know, there's a reason that's paying 8%. If treasuries are paying 2% or 1.7%, depending on the, t- on the term, why wouldn't you imagine something paying 8% has a little bit more volatility, a little bit more risk? So that's one of the things we have to do. We have to, we have to help people have reasonable expectations, whether it's the yield on a, on a particular investment or whether it's the long-term performance. We don't tell people, oh, we're going to double your money here, we're going to make this. I would never tell you 2013 is going to be a great year in the market. 
I wouldn't say that because we're not one year focused. We're focused over the next five or 10 years. We think the market has good room over the next five or 10 years. I think inflation is going to be relatively low. We don't know that because things can trigger that. But um, at this point, the Fed has vowed to keep interest rates down until mid-2015. That bodes well for the market. That bodes very well, stock market. We're talking to Ralph Scariano, who is uh, with Edward Jones Investments here in Albany, Oregon, on Kalapua Street, southwest uh, suite number C. And we'll be back with Ralph here on Valley Talk in just a moment. Going out to lunch at a nice restaurant can be expensive, and the big portions put you more in the mood for a nap than a productive afternoon. Mama's fine Italian to the rescue. The small appetite senior menu is just right. Anyone and everyone is invited to order from the Light Appetites menu for lunch from 11 to 4 p.m. with tasty entrees beginning at only $3.95. Why go hungry or go anywhere else for lunch? Eat healthy, eat light at Mama's. Close Sunday and Monday, so make the most of Tuesday through Friday and join your friends at Mama's for lunch. Dinner only on Saturday. Mama's features charbroiled steaks every day. Make reservations for dinner or pick up a bottle of fine wine. Seating is limited, so please call for reservations. 541-451-5050. That's 451-5050. Mama's Fine Italian and Wine Shop. On West Oak, between Main and 2nd in Lebanon. Across from the Big Blue Napa Auto Parts Building. At HomeSmart Oregon, we still believe in the American dream of home ownership. Take an online homebuyer class to help you make smart purchase decisions. HomeSmart Oregon can give you expert advice to help you save money and access down payment assistance. Visit HomeSmartOregon.org to learn how an online homebuyer class can help you achieve your American dream. Be smart with HomeSmart Oregon. Sponsored by HomeSmart Oregon and aired in cooperation with the Oregon Association of Broadcasters and this station. Horse lovers, get ready for another great ride in March. Hi, this is Rick Lamb of The Horse Show, Sundays on KGAL. You've heard my radio show or seen me on RFD-TV. Now join me in person at the Northwest Horse Fair and Expo, coming to Albany. I have several presentations on different topics you'll want to attend, and of course you'll want to see the exciting clinics and entertainment, colorful exhibits, and shop at the trade show. Coming March 21st through 24th, it's the 14th annual Northwest Horse Fair and Expo. I'm Rick Lamb, and I'll see you there. Downtown Albany. Clothing, fine jewelry, do-it-yourself craft stores, furniture, toys, gifts, salons, event venues, live theater, movies, and 23 restaurants. More choices than you'd ever find at any local mall. Find it all in historic downtown Albany. Grab a cup of coffee, learn a new craft, do a little shopping, pamper yourself at one of the many salons, and then enjoy a scrumptious meal. Bring your family or meet new friends. Great entertainment, delicious dining, and unique shopping. It's all happening in historic downtown Albany. The Albany Public Schools Foundation presents the iRun. Don't be confused, this is not a new exercise device. This is the iRun for Kids 5K Run Walk and 10 Mile Run on Saturday, March 16th for the Albany Public Schools Foundation. Register online at albanypublicschoolsfoundation.org. iRun for Kids proceeds support Albany Public Schools Foundation's Classroom Grants Program, enriching the education opportunities for Albany Public School District students. Let's run together. The Car Show, Saturday afternoons on News Talk 1580, KGAL. And this is Valley Talk. I'm Dave Adams. Glad to have you with us today. It's sunny outside. Looks good. Ralph Scariano with Edward Jones Investments in Albany is in our studios today. We're talking about the stock market and uh, what may be some of the things we should keep in mind as we're looking at investing in the stock market. Tell you what, uh, we are also taking your applications or your uh, contest submissions for Quiznos Taste on Us. And at the end of this show, in about 35 minutes, we're going to be giving away a $10 gift certificate for Quiznos in Albany, right next to Novak's Restaurant and next to the former G.I. Joe Sporting Goods location. $10. A gift certificate. You'd buy uh, sub sandwiches, uh, chips, drinks in the store, and um, get your entries in now. You can send them to Dave at KGAL.com or call the station at 451-KGAL, 926-KGAL. Thanks to Dale and the crew for being involved in Quiznos Taste on Us here on Valley Talk. Ralph, we were talking during the break. I know you kind of want to stir away from this, but it's, it's in the news everywhere. I like talking about it because I, I like tech stuff. Facebook, Google, Apple. Um, it kind of reminds me of the, we, you called it, I called it the tech bubble or a yeah. while back. Internet bubble. Internet bubble. Yeah, the tech wreck. <laughs> the, you called it the tech wreck. <laughs> and it kind of was. Yeah. But 
as as we look at things like Facebook and Google and uh, Apple, uh, what do you think? If you look at the industry, the technology industry, uh, I'll just say this from a, a broad perspective: uh, technology is 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 touted by many many firms right now as as a good place to put money. It's a more aggressive. They divide investments as aggressive and conservative and middle of the road, et cetera, et cetera, or growth stocks or aggressive growth stocks or or dividend paying stocks. So most technology, not all, but most technology stocks are considered to be in the aggressive area. But if you polled uh, the, the investment bankers of the world and the financial advisor firms of the world of the, of the U.S., uh, technology is one of the areas that is, is rated highly right now. Uh, I think, as I mentioned during the break, Dave, um, Apple, I can't remember exactly, but I think there's about 60 firms that follow Apple, and I think 49 or 50 have buy recommendations on it. Um, Google has many buy recommendations. Facebook has buy recommendations. It's not one that our firm follows, but it has buy recommendations. Um, it was kind of a misstep when it came out on the initial public offering, uh, but it's down now, and, it, and there's a lot of buy recommendations on Facebook right now as well. So I, I think technology, the biggest, the biggest risk in my mind in terms of technology is that somebody could quickly develop something new that could displace somebody unless they were well di diversified. It's very volatile. Yes, very volatile. Yeah. But, uh, no, I think technology is a good place to be. I think healthcare is a good place to be uh, going forward, just with the aging uh, population, the baby boomers. Um, housing appears to be a reasonable area to look at, at uh, investments. At this point, I don't mean buying houses, but I mean uh, house home builder stocks and those kind of things. Uh, there's an investment uh, uh, product called REIT, R-E-I-T, Real Estate Investment Trust. Some of the REITs have some attractive yields right now and might make sense going forward as well. Who is your typical investor, and what? who should stay away from the stock market? Okay, now I asked that question, and let me define it a little bit more. So if you have a person that maybe is just trying to make it from paycheck to paycheck, and every, everything they've got is going into the monthly bills, that's probably not a prime candidate for investing in the stock market. Would you agree? I would agree. Probably not a prime candidate. If, if that client were to come in, I would first say... How, how are you doing in terms of getting the cash reserve? At, maybe it's your local bank or credit union and having a, a backup so that you, if you needed an emergency, you have an emergency fund built up. Uh, make sure you're funding your own company retirement plan and those kinds of things. And then if you have some extra money, come on in and we'll help you develop a plan. You know. Earlier in the show, I was asking if you're optimistic about the future. Uh, and this this uh, discussion, this next question, you're very political because there's a lot of talk show hosts that, that will rail on uh, Obama, the Obama administration for um, you know spending too much money. The national debt is how many trillion dollars? Sixteen, something like that. <laughs> and it gets very political very fast. But as you look at the future, and as you look at what's going on right now in the economy and job creation and so on and so forth, you say you're optimistic about, about the future. So let's kind of leave on this kind of a note. Um, Let's take a look at job creation, economy, and, and define for me again why you're so optimistic. I'm not an economist, but I can, I can speak to the stock market part of it. Sure. And so I'm looking at the long-term trend of the stock market. I'm looking right. where the stocks are priced today. Because one of the things people say, well, we're, we're almost back up to where we were in October of 2007. And that was basically the high of the market when things started slipping. But... Right now, stocks are trading, in 2013, they're trading at about 13 times earnings. Uh, average stock performance has been about 15 times earnings. So stocks are undervalued right now. The American economy is very resilient. Uh, we, we come up with all these challenges, all these things that have occurred over decades and decades, and some of the most recent things that have happened, and yet the American economy is resilient. No matter what side of the political fence you're on, oh, no right, Democrat, Independent, Republican, uh, it doesn't matter. It, I think we have the ability to overcome this. It, even in, when things look as, as uh, tough as they do today in terms of what's going on with Congress and et cetera, et cetera, I still think we have the opportunity to come through. Things are gradually improving. We are seeing job creation. We are seeing housing starts. We have seen things uh, starting to change a little bit. One of the biggest problems right now that, that has to happen is we have to get beyond the uh, this budget issue and, and, and the both both sides have to get together and, and compromise on that and, and get something done. Is that a big variable in an investor's mind? In other words, the budget, the, the, the national debt, the budget, we hear a lot of that on the media, in the newspaper, radio, TV. That's dominating conversation. It, it right is now. a big variable in their minds, Dave. 
I don't think it's a big variable in where they're going to go from 2013 to 2018. I think every time there's something that goes on in this country, in this economy, I, everybody thinks this time is different. This time is different. And every it's time the thing comes back again. I mean, when 2007 and 2008 occurred, people bailed right and left. And I, we tried to, as advisors to say, you know, we'll get through this. We'll get through this. And we have gotten through this. We've come back a huge, long way since then. So in, in 1987, we had... It was Black Monday? I can't remember what it was called. Black Monday, I think. And uh, I was I came here in '81, and that, and everybody thought Black Monday was the end of the world, end of the stock market. Got through that, and we've had a, a banner returns from '87 through about 1999, I think it was. And of course, we had some things slip then, and of course, we had 2011 or 2001, which 9/11, which was terrible, and yeah. and uh, and then we've had other things. But again, why I'm optimistic is because it's my. I guess my my political and patriotic belief that we're going to get through this because of the American ingenuity, the American drive, American corporations, and American corporations are making money, and that is a stock market. That is not the U.S. government. That is not Congress. American corporations are making money. And when investors look at the stock market, look at what American corporations are doing. That sometimes American corporations are doing well, but the economy is not, and the stock market tanks. But the corporations are doing pretty well. So, you know, I am going forward, I think we're, we'll be fine. But not, we're not predicting 30 days, six months, one year. We're saying going forward. Ralph Scariano, Edward Jones Investments in Albany, Oregon. How do people get in touch with you? Uh, uh, EdwardJones.com. Put in my name or city of Albany, and you'll see a list of our eight advisors in Albany. Okay. Thank you, Ralph, for being on the show. Look forward to having you again in the future, and um, go make some money. I appreciate it, Dave. Thanks very much. Coming up next, we have Tom Cordier in the studio, and there's some measures. Measure 22117, measure 22116 generated a lot of conversation on Main Street, uh, in the media, and we're going to be talking about uh, this with Tom and about his position and why he's proposing a yes vote on these measures. Now, we are going to have the other side on uh, this issue, and that's going to be Thursday with uh, Mayor uh, Sharon Canopa here on Valley Talk. We'll be back with the program in just a moment. The Osgood Files, sponsored in part by Regis. Let Regis help you to focus on your business while they take care of your workspace needs. Get two months free on a fully wired and furnished office. Call 1-800-OFFICES. This is Charles Osgood. Two British designers have come up with a wonderfully low-cost, low-tech, high-impact source of light for a third of the people on Earth. It requires no batteries, no kerosene or fuel of any kind, and there's no running out of what it runs on, which is gravity. Jim Reeves is one of the two creators. So the product consists of the generator ambient light unit. It's shipped in a very robust bag which takes ballast. You take it out of its bag, you fill this bag with gravel, sand, soil. You attach the bag, you hang the product, and when you lift the bag, then you have your light source. More after this. Businesses, from startups to Fortune 500 firms, have something in common. They're intentional, they focus on success, and they don't get distracted. And many successful businesses have something else in common. They work from a Regis office. Your beautifully furnished, wired Regis office can be ready when you need it with a receptionist, access to meeting rooms, and state-of-the-art video conferencing, all with no long-term lease. Regis is the new way to work. Call 1-800-OFFICES and get two months free when you mention Osgood. That's 1-800-OFFICES. In this moment, who has your back? An insurance company delivering excellence during your claims process? Auto Owners Insurance has been recognized as highest in customer satisfaction with the auto insurance claims experience five years in a row by J.D. Power and Associates. Let an auto owner's independent insurance agent have your back so when the unthinkable happens, you get the claim service you deserve. For J.D. Power and Associates award information, go to jdpower.com. Find your local independent agent at autoowners.com. The Gravity Light is designed to sell for around $5.00. Each three-second pull on the bag produces a half hour of useful light. It's cheaper than solar technology. Co-creator Martin Ritterford can explain that. The trouble with solar technology is that you have to charge a battery with the solar power that you've gained from the sun, then use the battery power to power at night. So it was really important to find the cheapest way of supplying reasonable quality light to these people. 
To these people, the gravity light can be a giant leap forward. Right now, says Jim Reeves, a third of the world's population is off-grid. So you've got large communities across Africa and India and South America and even Northern Europe and into Russia where power is either intermittent or absent. So we want to take a large number of the devices out to the intended end users, get feedback on how the product would perform in the field. It's very different from the conventional solutions that people will be familiar with. To them, changing the world is, to use our late colleague Eric Severide's phrase, not so wild a dream. The Osgood File. I'll see you on the television. It comes Sunday morning on CBS. This is Charles Osgood on the CBS Radio Network. Make sure to attend the Albany Rifle and Pistol Club's 2013 Spring Gun and Sportsman Show. This weekend at the Lynn County Fairgrounds in Albany, you'll find over 20,000 square feet of exhibits, including guns and ammo. Free parking and admission is only $5. This weekend, March 2nd and 3rd, Saturday 9 to 5, Sunday 9 to 4. Call 541-491-3755. Take the I-5 exit 234 to the Albany Rifle and Pistol Club's 2013 Spring Gun and Sportsman Show. Call 541-491-3755. Be there. Jay Farner here from Quicken Loans. We get a lot of tweets from folks that sound just like this. Jay, I bought my home in 2007. Since then, it's gone down in value. Now I owe more on my mortgage than my home is worth. Can I refinance? The answer may very well be yes. Recently, the government announced changes that may allow folks to refinance even if their home has lost value. For example, if you owe $300,000 on your mortgage, but your home's only worth $150,000, Quicken Loans may still be able to help you. Or if your current mortgage rate is higher than 3.99%, you've got to give us a call today at 800-QUICKEN. And for three years in a row now, J.D. Power & Associates has ranked Quicken Loans highest in the nation in customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination. So if your current mortgage is higher than 3.99% or if you owe more than your home is worth, call Quicken Loans today at 800-QUICKEN or go to quickenloans.com. For J.D. Power & Associates award information, visit jdpower.com. Important terms and conditions apply. Calls for cost information. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states and MLS number 3030. Into the woods and onto the waters. Listen to Northwestern Outdoors, Saturday nights on Smart Talk 1580. And this is Valley Talk. I'm Dave Adams. Tom Cordier is with us in the studios. Tom has been here before. You've seen him a lot in the newspaper and uh, in the media. And you've seen him a lot in the street corners, ad asking people to sign up to vote. And uh, uh, pushing measures 22117 and 22116. Uh, 22117 would require a public vote. Uh, if the city were to add to its debt, 116 would require a public vote to create a new urban renewal district or substantially change the existing one. Tom, welcome to Valley Talk. Thanks, Dave. Nice to be here. What are you hearing on the street? Well, we're really uh, happy with what we're hearing. Uh, I'm enjoying the campaign, and uh, we collected the 4,200 uh, valid signatures. We'll see in a couple of weeks. Uh, how what the people think uh, the issue here is providing good information to the voters uh, we've uh, really tried to do that our opposition has been providing some misinformation and uh, based on fear tactics and we're trying to overcome that and we think we can let's talk about that a little bit the opposition uh, <clears throat> in fact you are you complained to the state that uh, the city manager for one was um, campaigning for this on public dime, so to speak. Yeah, I did. Uh, it was based on a uh, June comment that he had made at the city council where he said he knew that he couldn't enter the uh, public arena with his opinions because he was on duty 24-7. And apparently that uh, requirement uh, was either misunderstood by him at that time or the, uh, the law changed, which allowed him to do that. And the Secretary of State's office said, no, no violation. He can do that. How do you and feel and we're, we're happy about that. I, I, I wouldn't restrict anybody's uh, conversation, public conversation about these things, let alone uh, Mr. Harris. What are the concerns from the people that are opposing your measures are that it will unduly tie the hands of the city financially. Uh, if they have to go to the public to get approval to add to its debt. Um, a lot of people are having a question about what they're calling the vague description of debt. We, uh, talk to that a little bit, if you could. Well, um, I think that it's, uh, it's just campaign rhetoric. Um, city government is most effective when the governed give direct consent on really big financial decisions. And debt and urban renewal uh, 
uh, plans are really big money decisions. Uh, another level of accountability is needed. Everyone who pays their expensive water bills understands that half the water bill goes to the $90 million debt that was uh, created uh, without their approval. Even uh, Hasso Herring says now that the uh, city council should have asked voters before they went into that kind of revenue debt. And uh, what's, what's interesting to me is that, is that the city now is uh, refusing to give the, the newspaper um, information about what its debt is. And Mike uh, McKinley, M McKinley uh, edit his editorial in the Albany Democrat Herald today, uh, blames the state for having confusing uh, and restrictive policies. My position is on that. The reason that the city won't give a definition of the debt is because the council has already instructed the city attorney to take this uh, issue to court and and try to use the argument that it's uh, con because we didn't define debt that they ought to throw out the measure, and and the, the crazy part is that that the uh, uh, the city's financial records tell you what the debt is and they classify it every different which way. Uh, they tell you what their debt is and what they mean by debt. Um, so right now, the, 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 once again, the, uh, the city attorney is driving the uh, discussion underground to protect his case later after the election, after we win. Uh, he'll take it to court and try to claim that, that we, we don't know what debt means. And that's why the city won't tell even the Democrat Herald as part of a public disclosure what the debt is it's 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 crazy it's it, it's it's grimy political uh, uh battle going on here and the city is uh ducking the thing trying to protect its legal options so do you think that the city is trying to paint a measure or paint a picture of well you know we can't incur any more debt they they try to label debt as police officers salaries and so on and so forth and we simply the inference that I'm hearing or feeling that they're saying is that it's going to tie our hands so we'll be able to un, unable to do business. Is that what you're hearing? And, from and, their and that's, the, that's argument. the argument that's being uh, portrayed. Uh, I, I got this uh, pamphlet that they published uh, filled, filled with uh, misinformation in the mail uh, one Saturday, maybe. When you say misinformation, can you quote some examples? Well, um, um, one of the pamphlet uh, headlines is it will keep jobs. Well, what jobs are we talking about keeping? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about the 13 deputies that the Lynn County Sheriff had to lay off because of the siphoning of money from the county public safety budget uh, into uh, uh, beautification of downtown Albany. Uh, I mean, what jobs are we talking about creating and keeping? We, they haven't created uh, but maybe a handful of jobs. The number of restaurants downtown in the, in the period have decreased by a, a net 12. And so the, the idea that voting no will keep jobs is fallacious. It just, it's absolutely just campaign headline. That's all it is. Is it the spending of CARA or is it the city, city government in all that's driven your decision to put these measures, especially the debt, uh, debt limitation measure in front of voters? Well, um, it, it, it's the idea that the city council can go into as much debt as they want to without getting voters to approve any of it. Was there a specific pro project that really caught your attention and you well, said this is an example of... Sure. And, okay. and, and everybody knows that the, the, some of the big money CARA items were crazy programs to begin with. And so that's when I started digging into it and trying to understand, well, what's really going on here? And the more I dug, the, n now I fully understand that urban renewal is being misused in this city to fund projects that only a handful of people want. And it takes money from public safety and from our schools and from uh, even the city operating budget. And, 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 and nobody had a, a, a vote before that was enacted. 
What would you say to the people who agree with people opposing your measure that the city has to look nice in order to attract business, to attract uh, customers, to attract businesses? Uh, people want to live here because they come in and, and it looks nice. And I'm not opposed to having it look nice. Not opposed to that at all. But, so they're saying, Kara, for example, Central Albany. Uh, th this isn't about Kara. Okay. This, my measures do not touch Kara at all. N n the judge told us that Kara was instituted uh, legally. The city council was, with, was within its legal right to create Kara when it did in 2001. And on its own signature, authorized $56 million of debt with no termination date. So that, that program can... I, I won't be surprised if that, if, that, if that district is still operating 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. it, it's millions and millions of dollars with no time limit and spanning generations. And yet voters weren't allowed to participate. And that's the, that's the breach. It, that's the hole that we're trying to plug. For example, Corvallis cannot create an urban renewal district just by the city council saying, we want one. They have to go to the voters first. And so we're saying, look, uh, I mean, the mayor campaigned years ago about, well, she wanted the city to look like Corvallis, more like Corvallis. Well, that's what Corvallis has and we're asking for the same right. Voters ought to have a chance to vote before new urban renewal districts are created. Actually, they should have been allowed to have a vote before the first one was created. And, and the city council overstepped its bounds and created it just because they could. And we're saying now we're going to put it in the charter that says in the future they can't do that without getting voters to approve it first. Albany Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Committee recommending no vote on 22117. <coughs> They're saying it's poorly worded, could have, they quote, they say vast unintended consequences. Your response? I don't think it's poorly worded at all. Um, the city, the uh, chamber met, I debated the mayor at the chamber way back in June of last year. Mm -hmm. So the recent article that got published in the Democrat Herald was a repeat of, of, that, uh, of that decision by the Governmental Affairs Subcommittee. Uh, what, what's interesting has received no uh, press. In fact, I don't think even the, the uh, chamber members have been told that... Uh, recently, the opposition PAC, uh, have, they have two um, sitting members of the city council, uh, uh, Kopsinski and Floyd Collins. They are sitting members of the chamber of, Con uh, sitting members of the city council and directors of the opposition PAC and voting members of the chamber. And so they went to the, uh, to the uh, Governmental Affairs Committee and asked for them, asked for money from their organization to fund the measures, uh, f fund the, the opposition to these members, uh, measures, trying to get people to uh, vote against them. The, uh, if I'm, I may not be clear here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the two sitting council members went to the chamber subcommittee, the governmental affairs, and ask the, the chamber to give them money to help them defeat these two measures. Do you think that was inappropriate? It, it was absolutely inappropriate. The very idea that you could have two sitting council members currently in office uh, also voting members of the chamber of commerce where they seek to give themselves money is totally unethical. And to the extent that they don't understand that, that speaks volumes about the inside baseball that's being played with urban renewal here in this town and also with the creation of debt. One of the things that, as the rhetoric has continued in this particular campaign, that I find extremely interesting, it's almost, it's become almost like an abortion question where the number of people that are sitting on the fence 
at least my perception is you just go around and talk to people. You say, well, what about the Tom Cordia measures, 116-117? And um, you know right away uh, where a lot of people are because they, they go off. And they're either that, that your wording is too vague on the word debt limitation and so on and so forth, or... Uh, the ones that are very vehement are the ones that say, well, look at what the city of Albany has spent. And, for example, one uh, example was the, uh, the transportation facility uh, for transit. Uh, that, that's, that they, some people believe that was um, extravagant as far as funding uh, and others. And the word that keeps coming up from people that supporting this measure, as I talk to them on the street, is that... Uh, the city isn't financially responsible with spending money. Do you agree with that? I, I, I really uh, do, and, and I think that uh, they're generally out of touch with the, uh, with the current economic conditions. And uh, that's why it was uh, a terrible decision on the part of the city council when uh, Lebanon decided to under-levy freeing up $360,000 for Lynn County Public Safety. And the county commissioners appealed to the city council in Albany to do the same thing, to not have a negative impact on county uh, public safety uh, operations. And the city said, no, we are going to continue to levy our maximum amount and they did that even though they had limited themselves and they, they just banked the money. They didn't even spend the money. They banked it. Uh, I mean, it, it, they're just totally out of touch with what's going on economically. And that's why they need another layer of, of involvement from the public from the public at large before we can allow them to go into multi-generational big money decisions. We're talking to Tom Cordier about uh, measures 22117, 22116 and uh, ballots are out. They've been mailed and need to return their monitor before March 12th. Um, right. What are you hearing so far today? I know that it's, you know, it's just been a few days. Uh, have you talked to the the clerk's office? Uh, I know it's just I know it's really early in the ballots being out. It's early, and uh, and I haven't talked to the clerk's office. It'll be interesting to see if if we can learn um, how many uh, ballots came in over the weekend. I, my understanding is that a lot of that voting is done actually by mail, and so you wouldn't expect the ballots to come back before uh, Tuesday. Uh, but we're we're just encouraging people to vote. We think this is a valid public discussion, and it's the only real way to know what the public wants to do is to give them the right to vote. Is your phone ringing off the hook? Uh, I actually, I got a couple of phone calls yesterday. It's not off the hook, but people really are engaged. They, they, um, I think the Democrat Herald and some of our uh, ads and that kind of stuff have really uh, piqued the public's uh, interest. And, and I, I sense, as, uh, as I go around and meet people, uh, that people really are engaged. And, and I would tend to agree with you that a lot of people have, have really made up their minds. I mean, they, they, they see what they see, and they hear what they hear, and they say enough is enough, and, and they're ready to vote. We do want to remind you that Sharon Canopa will be on the show Thursday in a 30-minute segment here on Valley Talk, talking about why she is against measures 22, 116, and 117. More on Valley Talk today with Tom Cordier in just a moment. Banking these days can be pretty impersonal. You've got your big banks, your internet banks, your do-it-yourself banks, and your too-big-to-fail banks. That's why you might be interested in an alternative. Well, I'm at Community Bank. Hello. This is Bill Higby, residential lender. You deserve better service without sacrificing a thing. So if you're feeling underserved, make the switch to the best banking option out there with branches in Albany and Lebanon. Well, I'm at Community Bank. Service like no other. We promise. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. That's someone enjoying a wonderful meal at McDonald's. That's someone enjoying a refreshing Coca-Cola for only a dollar. 
And that's the harmonious flavor of McDonald's and any size icy cold Coca-Cola soft drink or sweet tea for just a dollar. It's hard to describe it any other way. The simple joy of... A la carte only. Prices and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Some people don't get the Northwest. Sure, we're a little eccentric, but we take plenty of things seriously, especially when it comes to food. That's why McDonald's new Fish McBites are perfect. Wild-caught Alaskan Pollock that's totally delicious. The catch that's caught here. McDonald's new Fish McBites. Flaky, bite-sized pieces of Alaskan Pollock cooked to crispy perfection. It's more fun flavor to love. If it's eccentric to take food this seriously, then who wants to be normal? At participating McDonald's, limited time offer. The Shedd Institute is pleased to present Siri Vick in My Funny Valentine, a revisioning of her touching spring 2012 tribute to Lorenz Hart. Where or when? The witty, light-hearted, and at times gentle, haunting, and deeply sad lyrics of Lorenz Hart have often graced the Shedd. Yet there is also something very special about Lorenz Hart that's perfect for Siri Vick. Witty, playful, and oh so cool, these songs are as often love songs as any other popular genre. Yet at the same time, snuck in among those multi-syllabic rhymes, folded in with the double entendres and the endless embrace of popular culture. There was no one who did this more or better than Lorenz Hart. And there is no one better than Siri Vick to reintroduce the man and his lyrics in the full range of their mood, technique, and spirit. For tickets and information, call 541-434-7000. The Shed Institute presents Siri Vick in My Funny Valentine, Wednesday, March 5th, at the LaSalle Stewart Center on the OSU campus. Safe Haven Humane Society will host its annual D-Sex in the City Spaghetti Dinner and Dessert Auction on Wednesday, February 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Lynn County Expo Center. Entertainment is courtesy of OSU alum and Broadway singer Roosevelt Credit, who will be joined by the Oregon State University Choir. $20 adult, $12 children's 6 to 18 tickets are available at Safe Haven Humane Society on Highway 34 or at Safe Haven Downtown on 2nd Street. Proceeds benefit their spay and neuter program. Yum. Yahoo Sports Radio, weekends on 1580, KGAL. Yahoo! Valley Talk, we got a couple minutes left to go in the show. Tom Courtier has uh, graciously uh, uh, agreed to come on the show today. One of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to have Sharon Canopa and Tom in the studios at the same time so we could ask a question and get the pro and against side on the same program at the same time. Uh, Sharon's going to be in Thursday's show. Main reason for that, Tom, is that you did not want to be in on the same program with Sharon or somebody against your measure. Why is that? Well, because I've, I, I've done there, been there, done that. Uh, I've appeared in public and public debates with the mayor a few times and certainly uh, Councilman Kopczynski here on this program. Um, the the misrepresentations of the other side do not make for a meaningful discussion. Uh, Fear-based accusations detract from the issues. I I'm really have no interest in responding to the fear-mongering. The sky is going to fall. We won't be able to do our jobs. You're just you're going to kill this city. I I, I can't respond to those kinds of accusations uh, I, 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 I just don't believe that they're valid I mean it's similar to what's going on in Washington DC today the whole idea that that some people want a, 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 a less than two percent reduction in a four trillion dollar annual budget and that's somehow gonna gonna uh, kill everybody in in the in the nation. So you don't believe it's going to kill the city or unduly no. financial time they have the absolutely, city of It absolutely will not. The the city will survive. the 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 whole idea here is that the city, who um, who is afraid of voters making big decisions, is a council that absolutely needs to have voter make decisions. Tom Cordier, thank you for being with us on Valley Talk today. I'm Dave Adams. Don't forget, uh, Quiznos Taste on us. Send an email to Dave at KGAL.com if you want in the drawing. Have a good day. I'll see you tomorrow. The Mid-Valley home of Smart Talk. This is News Talk, 1580 KGAL, Lebanon, Albany, Corvallis.